This happened a few years back. Just me. Alone. Took my RV down the Pacific coast for a change of scenery after getting laid off. Freelancing life gets to you, cabin fever and all that. Figured some ocean air and sunshine would recharge the batteries, you know? Call me Rhett. Thirty-something then. Tech support drone before the company folded. Bit of a loner, if I'm honest. The open road had an appeal. See if a guy like me could do the whole self-reliant thing for a while. Found a nice spot in this Redwood Forest campground up in Northern California. Redwoods are huge. You ever see them for real? Something otherworldly about them. The campground was nearly empty. Goodbye me. Tucked on a bluff overlooking the beach. Parked my rig. Cracked a beer. Felt better than I had in months. The problem wasn't exactly something bad at first. More like a tickle at the back of my neck. You know that sense of being watched. But spin around and there's no one there. Figured with all those big trees... Eyes play tricks. I tried to relax. Second night was worse. Thought I heard crunching footsteps coming up the trail towards my RV. Then they went silent, right when they should have been loudest. Got the flashlight, opened the door, nothing. Not even wind to speak of. Morning after? Barefoot prints up near my awning. Deep ruts in the soft earth. Now a boot print might mean another camper. But this, toes were big, splayed, weird. The prints didn't go back the way they'd come, vanished into the ferns. Told myself that some hiker lost his shoes, got lost. Couldn't shake the feeling of how wrong those prints looked, though. Third day, I moved campsites. Didn't tell the rangers, but figured something odd was going on. New spot was miles down the coast. A beach access one right out in the open. No tree cover. Felt safer somehow. Built a fire. Had some hot dogs. Even started to relax. The screaming started as the sun dipped low. Woman's screams from way down the beach. Not terrified screams, though. Excited? And something deeper under that. Low. Almost like moaning. I hesitated. My gut tightening. Didn't have cell service. Figured, well, folks get frisky sometimes, even if it's broad daylight. Maybe didn't want anyone watching. Turned up my music to drown it out. That night in the firelight, I swore I saw something big moving amongst the dunes. Couldn't make out a shape, just big enough to stand. I doused the fire, locked myself in the RV, couldn't sleep the whole night through. Dawn broke and I went exploring. Wasn't going to wait around anymore. Down past the last cliff, footprints again. Like those last ones, only way bigger this time. They came in from the surf, and the screaming had been in the same spot. Whatever made those feet was huge. Had to have come up over the dunes, but there were no tracks heading back out to sea. I drove home the next day, never going back there. Read about a lady hiker a few weeks later, gone missing at a park around the general area. Never did find her body. Now the thing, if I told any regular person, they'd never believe a word. Hell, half the time I barely do. What else was possible, though? You tell me, what leaves tracks like that? That can stalk a person along those trails? It didn't need to chase me away. It just wanted to make sure I knew. And I did. I went online after spotting that hiker news. Searched for everything weird I could find about the Pacific Northwest. Sasquatch stuff. Old tribal legends. The works. Most was laughable trash. But then I stumbled on a site so janky it had to be run by the real weirdos. They had a whole forum section on disappearances in national forests going way back. Photos uploaded, blurry, pixelated, but all those footprints, same damned shape, and something those folks whispered about, not just missing bodies, but finds with bones ripped to pieces, meat eaten like there'd been a feeding frenzy. The site owners weren't shy. They blamed a hidden predator, older than mankind. This isn't the reveal in a story, 
more like the point where you trade that fear of the unknown for the cold truth. Whatever this thing is, it isn't new. It's smart, has its system. It likes that stretch of woods best, has for ages. The screaming woman, not the first, likely not the last it would lure out with some sort of sick ritual call. They don't find all the bodies, but it's always watching, waiting to pick off the stragglers, the folks who think they know better or won't see the signs. I did everything a hunted animal would, ran, changed territory. Yet here's the truth, only the hunted ever really learn. Some predators only get bolder as they get hungrier. There was one blurry tale uploaded by those sight weirdos that made me sick to look at. Taken down now, but I saw it. A grainy snapshot of an RV from years back up some dirt logging road. Same model as mine, but this one had claw marks like gouges deep in the side panel, parked just at the edge of those tall trees. Thing must have watched it drive through the area, circled that night when the owner thought they were safe, but didn't finish the job. Let them live in terror a while longer. It was a warning, clear as daylight. They were right about one thing. I never went back to the coast, took long hauls east instead. I park in well-lit truck stops most nights, avoid even rest areas unless there's crowds there. Every single night I check the locks twice, never thought the open road could feel like a prison. My girlfriend finally left me, thought I was a paranoid nut, wouldn't listen. She's probably better off. The ocean calls sometimes, like a bad memory, pulling at me. I drive further inland, can't shake the feeling though. Some days the rearview mirror is full of trees. They get closer, I swear. Like it's only a matter of time until my road runs out. Forest takes it back. Same as happened to everyone who came before me. It's the curse of being prey. You stay alive, but in some primal way, you know you've already lost. It's just a matter of waiting for the moment it decides to finally close in. This happened to me a few years back. They call me an urban explorer. You know, break into abandoned buildings, snap some photos, get chased out by security if someone gets wind you're there. No big deal. A bit of danger. A bit of excitement. Nothing really dangerous. Mostly, these things happen off the beaten track. Old factories, hospitals, the sort of places everyone forgets about when the last worker gets laid off. Then they rot until someone with a YouTube channel sees dollar signs. That's how I find most of them. Then there's that trip to Maine. An old asylum, way out in the sticks. My buddy Vincent swore the place was haunted. Real cliché stuff. Me, I figured a couple of beers, a couple of spooky pics. We'd leave with a good story. That's all it ever was. Turns out, I was dead wrong. The moment we step over the broken down fence, Vincent points. Fresh tire tracks near the back loading dock. We check them out. Big truck or van. Maybe another crew here for the photos. But no cars in the lot. We enter this old rusted fire escape leading up to the second floor. It creaks under my boots, echoes carrying who knows how far. Inside, it's the classic horror trope. Peeling paint, shattered glass, and rooms left like somebody had run screaming decades ago. Vincent takes off like a bloodhound looking for ghosts. I try to get a few decent shots under the fading natural light. There's this long corridor with flickering fluorescent bulbs. Every few steps, another shadow seems to dart away. A trick of the mind, sure, but it puts me on edge. Maybe there was someone else, an animal, or another explorer who spooked us with the truck outside. I call out to Vincent, but no answer. And that's when the noises start. Not voices, not animal cries. Like scratching, then banging coming from the far end of the hall. And a smell, metallic and old, a sickly sweet rot I had never experienced before. Then, a shadow that moved. Wrong. No way it was human. Tall, hunched, dragging what looked like a length of chain along the grimy floor. I freeze heart-pounding fit to burst through my chest. Then, I turn and bolt. Corridors fly by, 
and there's still silence outside of my panicking breaths. Then I break out into this big storage space, crates lined up against the wall. A heavy thud makes me spin around. The figure blocks the way out, blocking the sunlight, a twisted form I won't ever forget. Pale skin, blood running in streaks down its chest, teeth filed into jagged edges. Vincent's phone lay just in front of it, cracked as if dropped from a height. Its eyes find mine, hungry and bright. My name's Idris. That day, I lost Vincent. I'm no cop, I can't say for sure he's dead. But his social media went quiet, never another mention of this haunted asylum. His family? Well, they just think he disappeared. There was nobody to look for answers after I ran. No police report. Because what would I have told them? That a monster came out of the dark and I escaped by the skin of my teeth? Now my phone's full of half-deleted photos of abandoned houses, farms, hospitals. They're a taunting reminder that any one of them might hold another hungry shape lurking in the dark. My hobby used to be fun. Now every shadow makes me jump. My friends think I've gone crazy. Maybe I have. This happened to me a long time ago. I guess maybe ten years back now. Me and my buddy Kellen spent most summers fishing, hiking, or camping out somewhere along the Pacific coast. We both grew up on the shores of Southern California, and you'd be hard-pressed to find two guys more in love with the open wilderness. Back then, I had an interest in photography. Just messing around, nothing serious. Kellen knew that. So, when he decided to head up the coast and try out a new, secluded stretch of the Olympic National Park in Washington State, he asked me to come along and document the beauty. Naturally, I jumped at the chance. One sunny morning, we packed up my old RV. It was nothing fancy, but it made those cross-country adventures a whole lot more comfortable. It wasn't exactly an off-road beast, but with Kellen behind the wheel, we had faith. After driving north across the Oregon state line, we turned west, venturing away from the paved highway onto a less certain path. The further along those dirt roads we got, the denser the forest became. Massive fir trees towered over the RV on both sides, their thick canopy almost entirely blotting out the sun. An occasional logging road wound off here and there, but we stayed the course on the wider, unpaved track. As much as I loved the woods, my gut was sending off signals telling me we were straying a bit too far from civilization. We eventually did find a place to pull over, barely any wider than the RV itself. There was a tiny creek running nearby, making it about as idyllic of a spot as we could have hoped for. The first day went off without a hitch. We took a short hike down a nearby trail that had seen significantly more foot traffic than our makeshift road in. Snapped a few shots at sunset, roasted some hot dogs over a crackling fire. Pretty classic first day for one of our trips. It had been so long since we had a summer to indulge in these wilderness escapes, so we savored it. Morning came just as we hoped it would. Serene, the air clear and crisp with the faint smell of pine. After a quick breakfast, I grabbed my camera bag and Kellen shouldered his fishing gear. It was time to make good on our adventure. My plan was to wander about, photographing whatever sparked my interest while my buddy tried his luck in the creek. We figured two hours tops before meeting back at the RV for lunch. For quite a while, it was smooth sailing. I found plenty of fascinating fungi to photograph along the banks of the creek. Moss hung low from massive trunks in a dazzling show of nature's handiwork. Even just wandering in aimless loops around our campsite presented captivating visuals. I'd been so caught up I only vaguely noticed time passing. A glance at my watch jolted me. We'd been apart far longer than anticipated. Concerned about Kellen, I started hollering his name, hoping like hell my voice would carry through the thick trees. No answer. I pushed the unease down and began heading toward the sound of the creek, figuring he must have just lost track of time chasing trout upstream. 
That's when I saw the first sign something was terribly wrong. I stumbled upon one of Kellen's fishing rods. It lay snagged in some foliage right on the path. My unease blossomed into full-blown dread. He wouldn't just leave his gear behind. Kellen was a bit of a fanatic, taking meticulous care of all his outdoor equipment. I called out again, this time adding in a bit about finding his rod. Still nothing. I took a deep breath, trying to keep a level head. Accidents weren't impossible after all. Maybe he fell and banged his head? Sprained an ankle? With those possibilities dancing through my mind, I sprinted in the direction of the creek, praying Kellen had taken an unfortunate spill, but nothing worse. I crashed through the trees following the familiar gurgle of the running water. It was hard to tell how far I'd gone. Panic and adrenaline pumped through me, distorting my perception of time and distance. And then... There it was. An open stretch of ground lay right on the creek bank. Not wide, no more than about fifteen feet across. A few old fishing spots could be made out near the water's edge where trampled grass clung to the muddy earth. It looked like somewhere folks might go to cast a line from time to time. Nothing extraordinary. Nothing. Unless you took in the whole scene. There, splayed amongst the dirt, bits of fabric. Kellen's neon green t-shirt hung half in and half out of the creek, snagged on a jutting rock. The bottom hem stained a deep, dark red. I recognized the shirt instantly. He'd only packed the one. Just a few feet away, trampled into the ground, were Kellen's sunglasses and hat. Scattered about, I could only pick out small items. Bits of metal, pieces of plastic that may have been part of a pocket knife, and more cloth. Too much cloth. Kellen was gone. And from the looks of things, he hadn't left willingly. I barely felt my knees give way as I staggered back into the undergrowth. Something wasn't right. Nothing felt right about this. Every bit of my being screamed it. No bear, cougar, or other forest-dwelling predator would attack like this. It all seemed planned, methodical even. Something out there, some person, had snatched my friend. But why? This thought sent a fresh wave of sickening fear coursing through me. If they'd gone after Kellen with those intentions, it wouldn't be long before they got wind of me. I had to get out of there. There was a ranger station. I couldn't be all that far from the trailhead. Surely someone could help. Turning blindly, I broke into a desperate run back towards the sound of the creek. It became a guide. A way forward from the horrors I couldn't allow myself to dwell on. My lungs burned, each desperate gasp mingling with sobs threatening to burst. Every twisted root in my path held the potential for me to go face first into the tangled ground. Every snap of a twig sent a fresh stab of panic through me. Then, a sound that wasn't natural. Something big, moving through the brush ahead. A figure stepped out, blocking my path, and my body came to a shuddering halt. He was immense, easily seven feet tall, though hunched over in a posture that would be impossible for most men. His clothes were ragged, patched together in a mismatch of browns and rough denim. An old hunter's cap crowned his head, greasy strands of his dark hair peeking out at odd angles. But that wasn't what registered most immediately. No, it was the weathered leather, stretched, twisted, and formed into a mask covering his entire face. No eyes, no mouth, nothing but warped contours in tanned hide. I couldn't breathe, could barely scream just stared in abject terror. Suddenly, he lunged. I turned with a strangled cry, legs finally taking action after the initial fear froze me in place. Every sound magnified now. The crunch of damp leaves under my pounding feet, the whistling of my breaths, the distant howl of a dog back toward the road. He followed close behind, the gap never seeming to widen. With some burst of animal energy, I managed to reach the road and scramble into the driver's seat of the RV. He appeared as suddenly as I felt the keys drop from my fingers and clatter behind a pedal. His hulking frame was practically pressed against the window as I tried to fumble for the ignition. 
Finally, the engine whined to life. Slamming the RV into drive, I stomped the gas, a desperate lurch nearly sending me careening into the dense forest on the other side of the road. That summer ended forever in that single moment. We never found Kellen, or any explanation for what happened in those deep woods. For months, maybe even years after, I refused to speak of it, even to myself. And now I wonder what happened to the leather-masked monstrosity. It couldn't have stayed confined to that wilderness forever. Did it claim more victims? Does it stalk the dark forests still? It chills me to think about, and to wonder if my path will ever cross with those shadowed trees and that towering figure waiting beneath them once again. This happened to me a few years back. Back then had this whole digital nomad thing going on. Figured, why rent an apartment when I could work remotely, see the country? Got lucky, scored an old RV for cheap. Nothing fancy, kinda small, but enough. My name's Ryland, by the way. After a rough patch working odd jobs in Vegas, decided to head up to Yellowstone National Park for some serious nature time. Yellowstone is huge, though. Packed, too. Hard to feel connected to anything but crowds after a while. One ranger gave me the tip. Go down by Shoshone National Forest. Less traffic. Just as beautiful. Drove that RV along these bumpy gravel roads. Found a campsite. Finally had the solitude I craved. First couple days, amazing. Hiked trails. Took some photographs for my portfolio. Third day, I woke up to this buzzing sound figured it was a particularly aggressive mosquito at first. Sat up, swatted at the air, looked up. That's when I saw the drone. Thing hovered right outside the RV window, no more than an arm's reach away. It was weird, not some fancy model you could buy at a store. More homemade looking, wires poking out, camera rigged into this cheap looking shell. At first, figured it was some park ranger surveillance thing gone wrong. I got dressed, walked around the RV, trying to catch sight of whoever was flying it. Nobody there. Nothing but trees and silence. Called out, no reply. The darn thing didn't even flinch. I went back inside, watched it through the window for a while longer, wondering who the heck sent it and why. Finally, figured whatever. Must have been kids messing around, or those rangers playing hide-and-seek for some reason. Buzzkill, honestly but not something to freak out over. That night, the drone came back. Same thing, hovered directly outside. This time, I took some of my old equipment and tried jamming its signal. Nothing worked. Frustrated, I tossed a shoe through the half-open door to shoo it away. Bad idea. It zipped off into the darkness, the sound of its tiny propeller fading off with it. Next morning, woke up to my tire slashed. Had a spare, changed it myself. That was the breaking point. Called up the rangers, gave them a statement. They took it seriously, but not overly so. Didn't find anybody out there. Nothing they could do to stop it, unless they caught the owner in the act. I thought about leaving. Figured whoever piloted that drone might have done their damage and wouldn't be back. Should have known better. That night, I decided to sleep away from the RV. Figured that drone targeted it, probably motion activated or something. Took my backpack, sleeping bag, flashlight, and walked a bit off into the woods. Found a place beneath some low-hanging pines to bivouac for the night. Figured this would be it. I'd wake up, hike back, pack up, get out of there. Not how it went. Woke with a start in the middle of the night. Heard branches crunch nearby. Sat up. Saw a silhouette slip between the trees. Someone moving silently in my direction. Grabbed my flashlight. Flicked it on. Caught him standing a few feet away. This... This wasn't some bored teen or weirdo ranger dude. It was a man. Older. Face shadowed by his hoodie. Had this long, rusty hunting knife gripped in his hand. In that moment, something clicked. It was about him. 
The guy was off. There was something wrong with his eyes, like they stared right through me. My stomach twisted into a knot. Had to get away. Lunged at him. Tried to shove my way past. Bad idea. He was way stronger than he looked. Slammed against a tree. Hard. The impact knocked the flashlight out of my hand. He grabbed me, shoved me down onto the pine needles. The knife flashed in the moonlight. Now I ain't small, but he held me there with one hand like it was nothing. Didn't say a word, just knelt over me. That knife hovered. Then just as I thought, this is it, I'm a goner, I heard it. My RV engine cranked to life. I glanced back in its direction through the trees. He froze, head whipped around. In a split second he was up and sprinting toward the RV. Didn't take that chance for granted. Somehow, in some adrenaline-fueled surge, I scrambled to my feet and took off in the opposite direction. Heard him crashing through the woods, shouting something unintelligible. Didn't look back. Ran until my breath wouldn't come anymore, finally collapsing beneath a different tree. Morning brought with it this surreal relief. Still alive. Took me forever to find my flashlight, then hiked back to the RV. Engine wasn't running anymore, but my door stood wide open. Inside, trashed. Drone sat busted on the floor, and my gear strewn around it. The tire marks in the soft dirt by the campsite told the story. He got distracted trying to steal my stuff and gave up chasing me. That was my chance. Got in, put the pedal to the floor, and didn't stop driving until I hit a gas station and called the cops. Never went back to the campsite. No clue what he wanted. Didn't take anything valuable in the end. Maybe the man wasn't after valuables at all. Cops found some traces of blood on my backpack and an abandoned cabin out that way a week later. Didn't belong to a park ranger, that's for damn sure. Still haunts me to think if I hadn't woken up, how it could have ended. I got that drone rebuilt, by the way. Thing buzzes around when I go on hikes now, always keeping watch, just in case. This happened to me a couple of years ago. The type of stuff nobody believes until it's their own nightmare. Let me start by saying if someone tells you solo camping builds character, well, maybe, or perhaps it just breaks you. Thing is, life can already deal you a rough hand. In my case, a brutal divorce followed by my dad passing. Well, a guy just needs space sometimes. My name's Arlo, an ordinary name for an ordinary guy. It worked with too many hours and no social life to justify that fancy apartment I couldn't really afford anyway. The Ozark Forest held some memories from childhood vacations. They seemed the perfect cure for this burnout I was riding. It wasn't so much nature calling, more like desperate escapism. I packed up my RV with supplies, not those extreme survivalist kit guys have, just snacks, hiking boots, and the basic comfort stuff a city boy craves. That first day was idyllic. I found a little nook off a backwoods trail that screamed, private getaway. That evening, I even spotted a family of deer. Seemed like some good wholesome therapy was already kicking in. But the next morning, it started. There was this scratching on the roof, and it wasn't a squirrel. This sound was heavy, rhythmic, unsettling. It woke me straight up. I popped my head out of the roof hatch and swore. Deep gouges marred the metal big, ugly scrapes that hadn't been there before. I started scanning the area. Maybe this was some bear territory and all my nature documentaries didn't prepare me? Nothing. Then, this blood-curdling shriek ripped through the trees. It didn't sound like anything natural. Almost warped, human, but not right. I ducked back down, feeling uneasy, like I was watched. Then I found them. Wire cutters lying at the tree line, shiny and unused. It hit me. This wasn't random destruction. I felt cold. That feeling only got worse as I went looking. 
More of those scratches were all over the sides of my RV. Now, you'd think anyone sane would hightail it out of there. I almost convinced myself. Engine on, ready to bolt if needed. But damn it, that stupid side of me always kicks in. Maybe there was an injured hiker? My dad raised me better than to leave anybody out there in the lurch. I should have left. Idiot Arlo grabbed a hiking stick as if it would offer much protection and set out into the thick tree cover. Every creak and rustle had my head whipping around. Then, there it was. Movement against the tree line. A filthy figure hunched, almost blending into the undergrowth. Even from a distance, I saw something was deeply wrong. Matted hair, clothes hanging in shreds, bare feet. This could not be someone just roughing it in the wild. I called out, Hello, need help? That thing turned at the sound. Even with the sun hitting its back, I caught details. Long, scraggly beard, the dark, vacant look to the eyes. There was this feral vibe something primal in its movements. Then it vanished from view into the woods. I bolted back to the RV, shaking. Was I losing my mind? Should I stick it out? No amount of telling myself man up could overcome this terror gripping me. I kicked the RV into gear and gunned it, leaving a churned mess of dirt in my wake. Back on the dusty forest road, I started getting my city boy thoughts again. A hermit lost his marbles, or worse, Maybe he escaped some asylum? Should have called the cops, but on what? They'd have laughed or searched and found nothing. I decided right then, screw it. This solo therapy plan sucked anyway. Next stop, somewhere crowded. That turned out to be a campground up by the Missouri River. It was filled with kids screaming, RVs lined up like some weird suburb, exactly what I thought I wanted. Later, sitting by a blazing campfire surrounded by laughing strangers, I could almost shake the chill off, at least till bedtime. As everyone started retiring, that awful silence descended. There's quiet of the city and this, this oppressive forest quiet that gets inside you. No cars, no lights, just that darkness hanging heavy. My gut clenched. The earlier feeling was creeping back, that sense of being hunted. My eyes strained into the night. Was movement out there, lurking just beyond the tree line? That scream cut through the darkness again, raw and terrifying, setting my teeth on edge. No more hesitation. I threw gear into the RV. No plan, just the urge to escape. Keys fumbled. The engine roared awake, the headlights blazing as I tore out of there. It felt like every mile took an hour my head swiveling constantly, every shadow making me flinch. Morning found me haggard in a cheap motel with a vacancy sign blaring along a highway, some random strip of urban wasteland miles from any forest. Looking in the mirror, I didn't recognize myself. It felt like an animal had clawed through me, some core instinct ripped open from deep inside. And the worst part? That thing out in the woods... It probably never even thought about me twice. Just some random human it stalked from the undergrowth. Not an enemy, just prey. Now, the thing people ask if I suggest camping? Hell no. And the woods I see on hikes have to be the groomed sort with paths clearly marked by happy families. Maybe Arlo 1.0, the nature lover guy, died out there. At least a piece of him anyway. Now it's Arlo 2.0, urban critter to the core, and just fine with that. Maybe I was never the wild type to begin with. Maybe some lessons you don't pick up on nature documentaries, but out in those deep shadows where only predators have reason to lurk. This happened to me a couple of years ago. You always think stuff like this happens to other people, right? On the news, in some made-for-TV movie with cheesy acting, not to you. Me, I'm Elroy, just a regular guy trying to survive the daily grind working construction. Pays the bills, 
puts a beer in my hand at the end of a long day. So whenever possible, I load up my RV and try to disappear for a while. Nature's good for the soul, you know? Anyway, the last summer this whole thing went down. I figured I'd head up the California coast. Beaches, mountains, all that good stuff. Plus, maybe some redwoods in the northern part of the state. Never seen those giants up close before. Seemed like a win-win, a way to clear my head and escape the crowds for a bit. The first few days were paradise. Found a sweet little spot along the coast, right up on a cliff overlooking the ocean. Sunsets over the water, campfires on the beach. Could get used to this kind of living. I even joked about quitting my job then and there. Things took a turn a few nights in. Not anything big at first, mind you. Just that feeling prickle the back of your neck, like you're being watched. I looked around, but it was pitch black. Just me and the waves crashing below. I chalked it up to being overly tired, figured a good night's sleep would fix it. Next morning, though, things felt wrong. My campsite was a mess, not trashed, but small stuff out of place. I assumed it was the wind. It got strong near the cliff's edge. Still, couldn't shake the feeling I was missing something. So I ventured a little way down one of the hiking trails behind my site, not too far, just enough to explore a bit. That's when I found it. Maybe a hundred feet off the main trail, there was a pile of animal bones. Wasn't a carcass, like something had left its kill there. The bones looked scattered, almost arranged. In the center, stuck upright, was a skull. An animal skull, for sure, but way too big to be a coyote or deer. More like bear size, or bigger. Something cold seeped through my veins. Whatever made that thing? It wasn't natural. I don't consider myself a religious guy, but I sure had an urge to pray right then. Instead, I bolted back to camp, packed up my stuff as fast as I could, and hit the road. But even while driving, I felt a gnawing dread I couldn't shake. A day later I'd found a new spot, farther north. Figured if anything was back there on those old trails, it wasn't likely to follow. This time, I picked a more established campground near a national park. Thought safety in numbers was an idea, right? The first day or two passed without incident, and relief seeped through me. Maybe I really had overreacted back there. Then came my neighbor, guy name of Arlo. Arlo didn't drive an RV, just an old station wagon with all his gear haphazardly crammed in. We got to talking as neighbors do. He seemed nice enough. Little odd, but harmless. Arlo was into photography, the serious kind, with massive lenses and all. Had come up here searching for the perfect landscape shot, he said. Kept going on about how nature held untold secrets. At the time, I just figured he was some artsy hippie and went about my day. Then came the incident that brought this whole nightmare to a head. I got to talking to the campground host, an old guy named Frank, Turned out this wasn't Arlo's first trip to the area. In fact, Frank recognized him from the year before. See, a week or so after Arlo's last visit, another couple disappeared from the park and were never found. The cops did some searching, said bears probably got them, but nothing was ever proved. Frank thought something was fishy about Arlo, but with no evidence, just figured the guy was weird and moved on. After talking to Frank... That cold dread settled back in. What if he was right? What if Arlo had something to do with those people going missing? And now, here I was, his closest neighbor. That night, while pretending to sleep, I listened closely. Sure enough, a little past midnight, I heard movement outside. Saw the glow of his flashlight moving away from the campground and disappearing into the trees. He didn't return until right before dawn. I'd seen enough. That morning, I tossed the last of my gear into the RV without cleaning my sight. Didn't want to risk staying one second longer. When I went to tell Frank I was leaving, his cabin was empty. Arlo's car was gone too.
This happened to me a couple of years back. Not sure exactly how long ago now. Time gets muddled after trauma like that. It all started with this road trip my buddy Ari and I planned, right after finishing grad school. The whole explore the country thing before real life kicked in. It was his idea to rent an RV. Figured it'd be cheaper than motels. I'm more of a tent kind of guy myself, but hey, adventure, right? We ended up heading through Wyoming, drawn to the wide open landscapes and those epic national parks. Drove for what felt like ages, passing one-horse towns with quirky names and gas stations that looked straight out of the 60s. Eventually, Ari suggested we find a more remote spot off the main roads. And wouldn't you know it, we stumbled upon this dirt track near Wind River Indian Reservation that seemed perfect. Thick pines, towering above us, dappled light filtering through, a creek nearby. Picture postcard worthy, at least on the surface. We pulled in, and that was the beginning of everything. I like to explore, always have. Ari, on the other hand, he's content to kick back with a beer by the fire. So, I wandered the trees a bit that first afternoon, checking out our newly claimed camping territory. There was an eerily silent quality to the place. Maybe I was just hyper-aware because we were so isolated. It nagged at the back of my mind, something I attributed to being used to more... well, people, I guess. Anyway, I stumbled onto this weird scene, an old mining claim. Like, way, way old. There was even a partially collapsed mining shed, wood rotting, walls caving in. Probably would have moved on, but a bit of twisted metal stuck out, catching the fading light. Went through some scattered debris, rusty gears, old lantern glass, nothing exciting. The shed itself gave me the willies, so I made quick work of inspecting it. One wall creaked ominously as I stepped out, like it held its breath the whole time I was in there. Didn't linger to imagine whatever else might be lurking within. Back at camp, with a fire now dancing against the gathering dusk, Ari didn't miss a beat in teasing me about my mining obsession. It's kinda our shtick. He takes jabs. I don't bite back. The usual, gonna strike it rich, are ya, Ethan? Type banter. Truth was, something seemed off with that mining claim. Something I couldn't put my finger on. Night fell thick and fast, and we settled into our sleeping bags, more exhausted by the day's drive than I wanted to admit. We did some half-hearted chatting, but even in the dim glow I could see Ari nodding off. Sleep hit me fast too. Then, I woke up with a sense of dread that pricked every hair on my neck. I listened for a moment and my heart leapt. Someone was moving around on the ground outside our RV. No whispers just muffled footsteps, and then a chilling crunch and drag under the weight of a body. Ari was still out cold. I lay there paralyzed by fear. Could just be some curious animal. Raccoons get brave this far from towns, but a human-sized crunch? This place, the old claim, all of it just radiated bad vibes. I had to check. Creeping over to the RV window, I peered out, and my blood ran cold. A tall, gaunt figure stood a few yards away, wore worn work clothes and had stringy gray hair hanging from under a beat-up baseball cap obscuring most of his face, saw what he dragged through the dirt. It was Ari. I choked back a scream. There was the glint of steel, a machete of some kind, in the stranger's hand, moonlight playing on blood-stained metal. Ari wasn't just unconscious, he was dead. He'd never even woken up. There was nothing I could do but run. I burst out the other side of the RV and straight into the woods. I kept running, crashing through underbrush, dodging shadows, fear twisting me up inside. I heard nothing behind me, but I knew that figure was watching. He must have lived out here, some recluse turned killer. He knew those woods better than I ever could. His silence and knowledge gave him the ultimate advantage. I stumbled on for what felt like hours, but it was dark out there with just a sliver of a moon. Time melted away, 
the only reality was terror. Eventually I came out near a road where a lucky trucker spotted me, dirty and wild-eyed. He took me to the nearest ranger station. Law enforcement found the RV, but no trace of Ari, and no trace of his killer either. They talked about me as a trauma survivor. Some of them whispered I might have made up the whole thing. But that mine, the blood, they weren't imaginary. Even after years have passed, that primal dread creeps up during quiet nights. I always sleep with the lights on now and make sure I'm never too isolated. That guy is still out there, and some part of me believes he may never stop hunting. This happened to me a few years ago. Now let me preface. I'm a travel journalist by trade. Get paid to see places most just dream of. Sounds sweet, and it can be. But sometimes assignments take you off the comfortable, beaten path. My name's Reese, by the way. This story has its start back on assignment in Wyoming, covering one of those under-the-radar state parks. You know the type. Big on scenery, low on visitors. I pitched up one evening in an RV I rented specifically for that kind of trip. I had a bit of extra time, thought I might make a bit of a vacation out of it after wrapping the article. It's always a good idea to get the feel of a place by immersing yourself rather than just whizzing in and out, right? Turns out I should have whizzed. Night one rolled around and I made the rookie mistake of leaving the RV light on after the sun set. Attracted a cloud of insects I spent an annoying half hour battling. So the next evening, darkness it was. And it's real darkness out there. None of that weak suburban glow polluting the skies. I fired up the grill, cracked open a beer. Nothing like a cold one by the fire when you have a whole landscape to yourself. It wasn't all sunshine and roses. Got those prickles up the back of my neck once in a while. That feeling like you're being watched even when there's nobody around. But yeah, I pushed it down. City boy getting spooked was all. It was my imagination at play. After all, I could tell a story or two about creepy shadows cast by a flickering, lonely campfire. I tried convincing myself the noises were just critters. Turns out, I was way off the mark. It's that primal hum of fear that gets through. It cuts through reason and tells you that, no, something out there ain't what it seems. By then, the night's silence descended except for the sound of something rustling around out in the darkness, not like a raccoon in the trash. Heavier, a slow, shuffling noise. I chalked it up to a deer or something and carried on with my dinner. My attention should have been fully occupied. I should have listened properly and pieced together the fact that there was something too deliberate in the sounds approaching the RV. I thought to myself, that can't be just one animal making this much noise. Then... There was a bone-chilling shriek, half animal, half human, or to be more accurate, an awful amalgamation of the two. I'm not a jumpy guy, but let me tell you, by then, all the fine hairs on my body were standing on end. It's moments like that when you know, like on a primal level, that you're not alone anymore. It's as if you become prey under the gaze of something unseen. Now let me paint the picture for you. The RV stood just shy of a thick cluster of cottonwood trees, beyond rolling scrubland leading to the rising moon. My fire cast a flicker about thirty feet out. After that, pitch blackness. That's where the noise reached its climax. There was crashing and scraping through those unseen bushes right beyond the reach of the light. Every muscle in my body tensed with panic as I dropped my fork, clanging as it hit the grate and I was inside the RV before I even realized I'd moved. That's when I bolted the door from the inside, fumbling in my frantic rush. From my window, I watched those shadows outside. Each one seemed to lengthen in the moonlight, as if twisting into impossible shapes. My heart beat so hard it pounded in my ears. I wouldn't be surprised if you could hear it clear across the campground. That shuffling and grunting drew closer... And closer. My eyes narrowed. It was time to face this instead of trying to hide from it. 
Then the figure stumbled further forward and into the flickering firelight. It was the form of a person, yet somehow off. Too lanky, limbs bent just slightly awkwardly. My hand clamped down on the door lock, fingers numb with fear. Then, in that firelight, its head whipped in my direction. Its face, God, just thinking about it still churns my stomach, pale, drawn, almost as if it were decaying while still living. There were features, yet they were distorted, misshapen. But it was the eyes, these soulless pits set back too deep in its face. Just one look, and my gut twisted, churning with that raw animal fear we city folk rarely stumble upon. My fingers fumbled for the ignition keys. Forget this assignment. Forget this entire experience, I thought. It took three attempts to get the darn engine to kick over, my hands shaking too hard to get the key into the slot. With a roar, the RV lurched into reverse. With one last glance in the window, pure horror washed over me. The monstrous face pressed against the glass, an unnatural smile splitting its cracked lips. This close, there was an awful stench too, like rotten meat and damp earth. It seemed to burn a hole straight through me. Those horrifying dark eyes followed my movements inside the RV with chilling focus. My foot slammed on the pedal, but I barely registered the impact as it crashed in, slamming right into the side of the vehicle. In those few heart-stopping seconds, I could see something like an oversized claw raking against the door's metal exterior. I heard those horrible wheezing rasps, laced with an almost childlike whimper. Desperation surged through me as I desperately spun the wheel. The vehicle veered violently, shaking the creature as I accelerated frantically on the dusty road. With sickening relief, I glanced in the rearview mirror to see it stumbling and falling on the ground, momentarily defeated, and I did not let off the gas until I left the boundaries of that state park far behind. There were reports to the nearby park office, of course. I tried explaining my bizarre story. I even showed them photographs of the damage left on the side of the RV. But I could see something flicker in their eyes. Pity, doubt, maybe even disbelief. There were missing person cases, too. Unsolved, shrugged off as animal attacks or lost hikers. It's easy to brush these things under the rug of normalcy, isn't it? But even writing this out years later, a tremor runs through me. Whatever that thing was, whatever it's done, it has a reason to stay hidden festering in that kind of solitude. If that thing was human once, it ain't any more. No, sir. Nature cast it out of its fold long ago. The park authorities probably wrote me off as some kook. The article? Well, let's just say when I sent that draft off to my editor, he responded with, Not appropriate. He never gave me a clearer answer, and after what I faced, there was no way I was asking for clarification. My advice? There are reasons some places stay off the map. It ain't pretty out there. But sometimes, just sometimes, it's better left the heck alone. Don't go messing around in parts of the world that have forgotten about us. This happened to me a couple of summers back. Even now... Sometimes when I get restless and bored, I catch myself planning road trips, but always those well-populated freeways. Backwoods adventures? Forget it. No way in hell. My name's Elias, by the way. Photographer by trade. This ain't something I talk about much. It just makes me sound crazy. You see, my gig at the time was this whole Americana travel series. The brief... Document small-town charm, off-the-beaten-path places, that type of thing. I rolled into New Mexico in an RV I barely knew how to handle. One of those clumsy rental models they advertise as easy even for novices. My destination, San Lorenzo Canyon out east. It's the epitome of remote. Miles of empty landscape, dotted with ancient rock formations. The plan was to camp off some minor road that cuts through it. My first mistake was ignoring those local gas station warnings about flash floods. They happen with brutal surprise out there, apparently. 
It seemed stupid even to an inexperienced road tripper like me. First couple of days weren't so bad. Got lucky with a sliver of signal on my phone and managed to send off some good shots to my editor. Evenings were peaceful. Sure, I didn't find some ghost town, but this canyon had a raw beauty. But as you well know, things out in the vast emptiness go south real fast. The weather. I should have listened to those red-faced guys by the pumps. One minute the sky's a canvas of the deepest blue, the next it's rolling in with rain clouds that look almost black. My RV was pretty damn exposed. I remember thinking, I'm the highest thing amidst this flat rock for miles. This was when a wave of nausea and fear struck me like a damn bolt from the blue. I just had a certainty there was a storm a-coming. And not just some storm, like one of those monstrous desert events that tears trees out by the root. There was no time to drive further. Instead, I pulled off the road into a half-dry side stream, figured that if it rains at least the ground might act as some sort of basin. Inside the RV, I braced myself. The wind hit hard, rocking the metal box against its shocks. I kept waiting for the full weight of the rain, hoping my shoddy cover wasn't about to turn the whole journey into a total disaster. It never came. But the wind grew worse, and something about the sound... Well, it gave me chills. Every so often there'd be a strange sort of howl that was unlike anything I've ever heard. Like a chorus of coyotes and screaming birds somehow merged into one sound. My mind conjured up images of whirlwinds, of that RV rolling over under the onslaught. Maybe a twisted branch flying right through the flimsy window like a spear... That's the sort of overactive panic that takes over your rational mind out there, alone and exposed to nature at its harshest. I was stuck between dread of the coming storm and dread of what else might be outside. My heart pounded in my ears. I felt like throwing up. There was nothing to it but to stick it out and pray to weather gods in which I normally have zero belief. It gets bad out there on the bad days. I'm telling you, nothing good walks under that black sky. Hours and hours went by. Finally, I peeked out a narrow window into that gray curtain of a world. That wind just wouldn't give in. This is about when I made my big mistake. One that was born out of fear and pure bone-deep exhaustion. Thinking maybe, just maybe, I could catch some shut-eye while it wasn't actively downpouring. And somehow, some way. I did doze off. A fitful dream-riddled sleep broken by the rattling of the RV from all angles. A sudden jolt. It woke me in a cold sweat. My body moved before my brain registered that something was pushing into the side of the damn thing. Not the wind. It was this heavy rhythmic impact. That same guttural moan mixed with what sounded like an irritated whimper just outside. There was something alive against the outside wall, pushing like it could actually tip the rig over. My mind jumped from wild ideas. Mountain lion, fallen tree, escaped bull. It could have been anything. Fear kept me paralyzed, and then I was crawling forward and peeking just enough to see into the gloom. The shape shifted, and for a moment, all rationality slipped straight from my grasp. The form just shouldn't have been possible. Its silhouette, too elongated, limbs just a shade too long to be animal-like. But then it shifted just enough for me to see its face. It turned back for one brief glance at the RV as it skulked further off. Now look, some would call this hallucination. But there's a clarity to fear that I'll never forget. Its skin had a grayish tinge like a photo negative gone slightly green. There wasn't much detail due to the low light, mostly its shadowed outline and one thing very clear. It held itself on two feet. This is when I snapped into an adrenalized action. The ignition turned with trembling hands and I yanked the RV into gear. Whatever monstrous being had taken interest in the metal shelter I'd hidden in, it sure as hell didn't follow. There was the feeling of eyes trailing me watching from the canyon shadows 
as I raced back away from that desolate beauty out of New Mexico. I never sent word on what I saw. What would I even say? I know if I ever did, my phone would ping back with suggestions on local psychedelics and the effects of sunstroke. It's hardwired into us to deny what we cannot comprehend. To brush away the impossible as something our minds conjure up under moments of sheer, unimaginable terror. When I arrived in the next one-horse town with gas, coffee, and cell coverage, it was almost a relief to learn there was a minor earthquake reported nearby. A natural phenomenon, my rattled brain grasped for explanations. An aftershock. It made sense of the unnatural tremors the previous day. My fear subsided somewhat, at least to a dull, gnawing terror I thought I might be able to ignore. And I managed to carry on for a while. Finished up that assignment like the damn professional I'm supposed to be. Every so often, when I had enough of the concrete jungle I call home and started planning the next escape, somewhere deep in the back of my mind, I would get those phantom tremors again. Just the slightest echo of that day of unrelenting wind and rhythmic thumping against the outside wall of the RV. That glimpse of a grotesque creature. Was it ever really there? Or was it some horrifying trick of the light? One thing is for damn sure. There are places I ain't gonna go looking for. The world has dark corners, some more literal than others, and it wasn't meant for us in all its monstrous glory. This happened to me a few years ago. Now, here's a thing about me. I never liked RVs. There's just something about them that always rubbed me the wrong way. They feel cramped, plastic, and let's be honest, most of them come with some truly terrible interior design choices. But my fiance, Alara, was desperate to visit some of the smaller national parks out west. It's what she called our grand tour, where we would try to pack in as many parks as possible over a three-week stretch. My name's Ishan, by the way. That first week went surprisingly well. We picked up the RV in Phoenix and worked our way up through Zion and Bryce Canyon in Utah. It was the remote stuff that excited Alara, the kind of winding roads that take you deeper into the landscape until even the cell signal gives up the ghost. We found ourselves a pull-off in a corner of Capitol Reef National Park, surrounded by these massive sandstone cliffs glowing in the late afternoon sun. I'm not going to lie, it was spectacular. We cooked under the awning, and I even admitted that, yeah, maybe those awful paisley interior cushions had their own kind of charm in this light. The moment was broken by a tapping at the driver's side window. Standing there was an old man, looking weathered and disheveled like he'd spent weeks camping without a bath. He gave us a hesitant smile, said his truck ran out of gas a few miles back, and could we be a good Samaritan to give him a ride to the ranger station? No phone service up here, of course, and his old knees weren't up for the hike. My first instinct was a no. There was something unsettling about this guy. But Ilara jumped up, insisted this was exactly what this epic van life road trip was all about. Helping folks, you know? Besides, he needed our help. In he climbed, the van filling with a musty odor that wasn't there before. The guy hardly spoke while we turned back for the main road. I noticed he kept touching his faded camouflage backpack, like whatever was inside held something precious. I glanced at Alara, caught her worried expression reflected back at me. He directed us back, further on a dusty dirt road I swore wasn't even marked on our map, said there was a shortcut, knew these hills like the back of his hand. After what felt like hours, we arrived not at a ranger station, but an abandoned campsite with crumbling brick fire pits and what looked like an overgrown shack hidden on the far slope. My gut told me to put the RV in reverse, leave this dude in the dust, but Alara was already halfway out the door offering him water. Something just snapped in me then. Okay, that's enough, I yelled, probably louder than needed. Thanks for the ride, this guy muttered 
slipping down from the cab with his bag tucked tight underneath his arm. That's when I saw the knife tucked into his belt. Let's see what's so important, I told him stepping closer. There was a struggle, brief, but enough to feel his strange strength, fueled by desperation. Elara screamed. I stumbled back, and... Well, then it got really bad. It's still hazy, all those moments between my fall and seeing them both run up a narrow track into the hills and out of sight. By some miracle, I was able to find the main road after what must have been hours of walking. Park rangers had arrived, searched all day for Alara. The place felt cursed, that hidden camp swallowed by the shadows of the surrounding cliffs. In the back of my mind, I couldn't shake the image of them both vanishing into the distance, swallowed by the vastness of a wild space I never should have entered. Ilara's still listed as missing. There were rumors about other lost hikers. The cops muttered something about hermits up in those hills, but they found nothing solid during their search. Every so often, late at night, I think I see the glow of an RV headlight from my apartment window. A cruel trick of the street lamps. Some nights I find myself mapping out the parks from our trip, remembering every twist and turn. Logically, I know what happened was something human, explainable. A man desperate enough to use the ruse of a broken-down truck, a remote spot, and an overly trusting traveler. That's how it must have gone. Yet every time I close my eyes, all I see is Ilara vanishing into the wilderness. All I feel is the memory of that musty smell of dried pine needles and something deeper, older, unyielding, 